The brassy Indian sun rises over tiger country. The Samba stag eats in peace. The tiger is his enemy. Though for the moment no alarm calls from jungle companions break the dawn silence, but somewhere in the sun-striped shadows, the tiger is waiting. Who could ever claim that the lion is king of the beasts? The tiger is coming, and the world of the jungle knows it. burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? When the stars threw down their spears, and watered heaven with their tears. Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? William Blake, the 19th century English poet, was a deeply religious man who felt that God had surpassed himself when he created the tiger. Today we might question his views on evolution, but could anyone argue with his poetic vision? Tiger, tiger, burning bright. Tiger, the most elusive, the biggest, the most powerful, the most fearsome of the great cats, the cat with a reputation for preying upon man, silent, usually hidden, deadly, and utterly beautiful, a superstar who rarely deigns to give a matinee performance by making his entrance upon the natural stage in the full light of day, by instinct, a walker in darkness, a hunter in the long shadows of the moon. The creature's home, the steaming jungles of the Far East, or so we tend to think when we hear the word tiger. But the tiger has many homes, and once had many more. In some ways, the snows suit its hot temperament better than the tropic heat as this rare Russian archive film shows. A young Siberian tiger is captured by Russian wildlife rangers and their dogs. They're catching it for movement to an area where it can no longer prey on local farmers' stock. There are six races of tiger. They differ only in size, marking and thickness of coat. The shaggy Siberian tiger may look ridiculously out of place in this snow scene, but prehistorically, tigers lived in the frozen north. They're quite at home in the cold. Today, one of their problems is keeping cool in the hot climates to which they later migrated. <laughs> tigers originated in the snows of Siberia. From there, they were driven south by ice ages to the near and far east. Only 50 years ago, the six known races of tiger occupied this area. Today, their range has shrunk to this. At the top of the survival league, Indochina may hold as many as 2,000. India, the traditional stronghold, is down to 1,800 tigers. The thick forest of Sumatra may hide as many as 800. The lowlands of Nepal, the Terai, contain 200. The Sundarbans of Bangladesh hold around 20. There may be as many as 12 Javan tigers left. Iran and the Caspian area continue to produce rumors of tigers, but no definite confirmation that they exist. 
China once had thousands, but they're not even protected there. The tiny Balinese tiger is thought to be extinct, leaving an optimistic world total of 5,000, declining all the time. Starting with the prehistoric saber-toothed model, the tiger has always captured man's imagination. This saber-tooth, which lived 30 million years ago, was only leopard-sized. From saber-tooth to modern art, the magic keeps its hold. Magic captured in Henri Rousseau's marvelous, if unrealistic, tropical storm with a tiger. The illustrator of this early book of beasts had quite obviously never seen a tiger. But the Romans had. This 2,000-year-old mosaic comes from Cyprus. The Mughals invaded India from Mongolia in the 14th century and ruled for 300 years. They loved to hunt tiger. Savage as this scene is, they understood conservation. One emperor even laying down plans for a tiger preserve. A descendant of the Mughals built this life-sized musical tiger devouring a European. Known as Tipu's tiger, it was the favorite after-dinner entertainment of Tipu Sultan, the ruler of Mysore in southern India. Tipu had a superstitious reverence for the tiger, only exceeded by his loathing for the invading British infidel. The British defeated and killed him at Seringapatam in 1799. It's the savagery of the tiger that fascinates. The Maharaja's victim has been given fangs of a viciousness never seen in nature. In this later painting, the tiger almost dwarfs the elephant. It's said that the main fear of every Briton arriving in India was that he would be eaten by a tiger. The artist was always ready to oblige, even if the picture did not tell the true story. Throughout the Far East, the tiger is a magic animal. In Malaya, a single whisker, ground up in a portion of tiger flesh or bone, is said to kill a man. In Indonesia, tiger milk is a cure for sore eyes and powdered bone for dog bite. This is Tiger Balm Garden, an extraordinary monument to a cure-all that embodies in a single ointment most of the magical properties attributed to various portions of the tiger's anatomy. There is practically nothing that this panacea won't fix. Coughs, indigestion, stomachache, seasickness, and believe it or not, even halitosis. The advertising industry appreciates the selling power of the tiger, sometimes losing a little of its dignity, but giving the tiger the one quality it's a little short on, humor. And so to perhaps the most famous power symbol of all, the tiger you put in your tank. Fifty years ago, there were 40,000 tigers in India. Today, there are fewer than one twentieth of that number. So what caused the disaster? Remembering the great tiger hunts of the Maharajas, it's tempting to answer the gun, but that would be far less than the truth. Let's go back to one of those incredible tiger hunts and see what went on and how, if at all, it affected the future status of the tiger. This unique early color film was shot for his own personal record by Lord Linlithgow, Viceroy of India in the late 30s. The hunt has been set up in his honor and that of the first lady, the vice reign. The tiger hunt with all its ceremonial and panoply, was part of the hospitality of that vanished era. Today it may seem strange, looked at through our conservation conscious eyes, but to have refused an Eastern prince's invitation to such a hunt would have been a diplomatic insult, unthinkable of course for a viceroy. And there were still plenty of tigers left to hunt. Under the British the rules were strict and the bags usually reasonable. Of course there were excesses. One Maharaja accounted for 1150 tigers in his lifetime. Among the princes, a big slaughter was often a status symbol. Everyone was mounted on elephant back, including the beaters, who moved off to encircle a large tract of country known to contain a tiger. 
The guns rode in howdars. Basket-like affairs gave some protection should a tiger spring, as well as the steady platform from which to fire. The ring was built next. It consisted of a large U-shaped barrier of white cloth, open at the end from which the beaters and tiger would be coming. It may seem surprising that the tiger didn't leap over or burst through the cloth, but any wild animal, even a tiger, is scared of the unfamiliar. To it, the cloth is an impenetrable, encircling wall. At last, far off, the beaters are coming. The guns on their elephants wait nervously outside the ring. just ahead in that tall grass. And there, suddenly, is the tiger, clawing at that rare elephant. It's all over. In view of the present-day plight of the tiger, we may find this scene shocking. But that is to see it out of context. Those tiger hunters of the British Raj knew the value of conservation, if only because they wanted more tigers to hunt. They preserved the most important thing of all, the kind of country in which the tiger lives. Today, former hunting preserves are the main places in which the tiger survives. The hunter's classic pose. It belongs to the faded photo album, yet the tiger owes much to it. This, rather than the gun, is the weapon the tiger must fear today. Throughout its range, the forests are coming down, and the tiger cannot live without forests. In India, it has almost complete protection from firearms. Alas, the chainsaw is far more deadly even than the bullet. This is what it kills. Tiger country. Country not only for tigers, but for every other large wild animal. And for some small ones, too. This rickety tiger cub was found dying in a field of sugarcane. The mother had given birth and then taken fright at the sound of human voices, leaving the cub to starve. It's symptomatic of the other great pressure that threatens the tiger the sheer weight of human overpopulation throughout the Far East. Tigers and people don't mix well. One loses out. Inevitably, it's the tiger. Tragically, despite the efforts of rangers and vets, this cub survived only a couple of weeks. So what can be done to give the tiger a chance? The only possible answer is to set some forested areas aside, free from people and safe from the tree filler. Such an area is Tiger Haven and the Dudwa National Park on the opposite bank of the Niora River in northern India. Dudwa has forest, full protection by the Indian government and a stock of wild tigers. It also has the full-time concern of Billy Arjun Singh, a passionate conservationist. Arjun Singh believes that the time will come when wild stock can be reinforced with tigers bred in captivity, provided the habitat is protected. Inside the crate is a tiger cub, born in England at Twycross Zoo, presented by the Frankfurt Zoological Society to the Prime Minister of India as a gift and pilot experiment for such introductions. The cub has just flown from England and made a long, exhausting road journey from Delhi. Arjun Singh supervises her disembarkation outside his farm at Tiger Haven. Her name is Tara, which means star, and she is three months old. Up to now, she's lived behind bars. From now on, her life will be one of increasing freedom. 
Arjun Singh is one of India's leading conservationists. He has just been honored by the World Wildlife Fund, which subscribed a million dollars to India's $5 million Project Tiger, an all-out drive to save the animal in the wild. Arjun Singh has an extraordinary rapport with big cats. Even for him, to teach a zoo-born tiger to go wild is not a light undertaking. But he had already successfully reared and returned two leopards to the jungle. It might be a long process, but he felt reasonably confident he could do the same with Tara. Tara first had to establish a relationship with the other animals around the farm. Strangely enough, Billy's dog dominated her from the start. From the moment she arrived, Tara showed signs of her inborn hunting instincts. When she stalked a tame buffalo, she was careful to do so from the rear, just as a wild tiger would. Tigers don't become fully independent until more than two years old. Tara's education might take even longer. If it succeeded, it would be well worth it. Natural regeneration of tigers is slow, usually only half the litter of two to four cubs surviving. She had to get used to living with elephants and vice versa. The elephant is distinctly uneasy at being followed so closely by a tiger, even such a small one. Arjun Singh's elephants meet quite a few wild tigers in the national park. They're trained to be steady in the presence of an enemy who will, under provocation, sometimes spring at them. The elephant's final gesture makes it plain that Tara has come quite close enough. What threatened to be the trickiest introduction of all passed off quite peacefully. Harriet is the female leopard whom Billy has already taught to live wild, but she often returns to the farm for visits and showed herself quite willing to play with Tara. So Billy started Tara's training by taking her for walks in the forest. Tara, as befits a tiger, was a cat who liked to walk alone. She almost ignored Harriet, who sometimes joined them. Tara lets off steam in the chilly early morning air. These early walks served a useful purpose, to get Tara used to the sights and sounds of the forest. Sights like the deer she'd one day hunt, bounding across the forest track. After a month, Billy Arjun Singh took her within sight and sound of a large herd of swamp deer to see what she'd make of them. Arjun Singh has no illusions about the future of Tara's kind. He repeatedly points out that fewer than 300 of India's estimated 1,800 tigers live in protected forests. The remainder he calls forgotten tigers, safe from firearms and the now illegal trade in tiger skins are completely at the mercy of anyone who wishes to destroy their homes for a short-term profit in timber. He hopes his government will act to protect the forests in all of its 14 national parks and 135 sanctuaries, not just three parks as at present. Otherwise, what is the sense of teaching a tiger cub like Tara to live free in the wild when the wild may no longer be there?
<laughs> this time, the swamp deer escaped. But Tara will grow and learn, and in the safety of Dudwa, she will be able to put her skills to good use. But what of those other tigers, the forgotten tigers, not only in India, but across the face of the Far East? The tiger, secretive and solitary, as menacing as a hidden assassin, treacherously lying in wait to kill. Well, that's the way we've been brought up to think of it. Only recently have we begun to understand the tiger better. The tiger would far rather hunt wild animals than man. Those are his natural prey. But even the mighty tiger doesn't have the chance of catching deer in the open, in broad daylight. Daylight is for relaxation. In the daytime, the tiger seeks the shade. Those superb striped markings vary from individual to individual. The white spots are used as an aggressive signal when the ears are turned forward. A tiger's length depends largely on the size of its tail. From tip of tail to muzzle, a big male tiger measures 10 feet. Those canine teeth for killing and holding are often five inches long. The claws in those huge pads are attractile. The tongue used for tearing hair and skin from prey is as rough as a rasp. A big male weighs five to six hundred pounds, a female around 350. The Chinese have a proverb, two tigers cannot share one hill. Until recently, it was thought that the tiger was as solitary as the saying suggests. But now scientists are finding that tigers associate in the jungle more frequently than anyone imagined. Basically, though, they keep to their own home ranges, which may cover as much as 25 square miles. They have an effective system of letting each other know who is around by roaring and by scent marking. This tigress is sniffing the scent left at the base of a tree. That face she's making means that what she has detected is her own scent. Tigers have a rather poor sense of smell. At least they don't seem to use it when hunting to find prey. At short range, when detecting each other's scent, it's obviously adequate. But then the scent glands of a tiger produce powerful stuff. Its smell has been known to last for three weeks. Tigers vary in color from tawny yellow to orangey red. The striped pattern provides perfect camouflage amid trees or in reeds and tall grass. When ears are laid back, it usually signals aggression or anyway, action. Tigers have been known to leap 18 feet into a tree in an attempt to claw a hunter perched in the branches. Normally, though, they're too heavy for tree climbing. They have a special use for trees, though no one yet knows the precise purpose. With an action very like a domestic cat, they rake their claws down the trunk. It may be just to clean and sharpen them. Fragments of claws are sometimes found embedded in the tree. But individuals repeatedly use the same tree, so these deep and fearful claw marks may well be another device for marking out their home ranges. A mugger, a big marsh crocodile, launches himself. A tiger has disturbed him. But the tiger is far too powerful to take any notice. Tigers are marvelous swimmers. Of all the cat family, they take most readily to the water. Aquatic sports are an important part of the daily life of the tiger. The reason is once again traceable to the tiger's distant origins. It still wears a heavy coat and needs desperately to keep cool. In the Sundarbans, a swampy mangrove area on the coast, the tigers regularly commute between islands, swimming confidently across open water. Once ashore, 
The tiger does its famous disappearing trick, stripes hiding it effectively, even among green reeds. A glamorous Indian lady takes her daily bath. On the opposite side of the river, a magnificent adult male lies full length to while away the hot hours of the day. He lives in Dudwa National Park. He's never been hunted. He's watchful, though, even of those floating leaves. But he's not in the least apprehensive. If someone appeared on the riverbank, he'd almost certainly run away. It was once thought that all tigers were potential man-eaters, but now we know better. That crocodile is far more dangerous to man than the tiger. Jim Corbett, the great hunter-naturalist, estimated that perhaps three in every thousand tigers turned man-eater. They did so usually because they'd been wounded in jaw or teeth and could no longer hunt their natural prey. Or perhaps they'd eaten an unburied human body. Whatever the reason, they were the rare exception and had to be killed. The legend of the man-eater came mostly from hunters who often had very good reason to fear the animal they hunted. Left alone, the tiger is no more cunning or treacherous than any other predator. Anyway, such values, whether applied to tiger or crocodile, are purely human ones. The big male leaves the water. He has sensed he's being watched. Perhaps he heard the camera running. Now he's a little worried. But his reaction is typical. Though he looks horribly menacing, he's simply reassuring himself that there's no immediate danger to him. When he's satisfied, he melts away. A Victorian hunter wrote once, you will on no account move into a jungle infested with tigers without your rifle in your hand and both barrels cocked. Well, that's the kind of thinking that gave substance to the image of the sinister, silent killer. The tiger is mainly a hunter by night, but sometimes at dusk or in the early morning. His taste in food is surprisingly wide. Birds, frogs, fish, even mollusks. But principally, he seeks big meals. Buffalo, bears, young rhino, and of course, deer. He's a prodigious eater. The swamp deer know the tiger is around and fill the air with alarm calls. This time they escape. They frequently do. The tiger often goes three days without making a kill. Though a tiger sometimes eats 100 pounds of meat at a sitting, he doesn't turn up his aristocratic whiskers at a monkey. These grey langurs spend a lot of time on the ground and are therefore fair game, if the tiger can catch one. The drama is caught in slowed up action.
death is instantaneous. Because tigers are essentially nocturnal, filming them at night calls for intensive preparation and highly specialized camera equipment. Traditionally, hunters build a hide or machan high in a tree and sit there all night if necessary until the tiger passes below. When our camera team, Dieter Plager and Mike Price, built a machan to film tiger at night, it was on level terms with the tiger, on the ground, a far more dangerous location. The apparatus they used was called an image intensifier. Attached to a movie camera, it enables normal lenses to see in the dark. This highly sophisticated electronic device was developed by the British as a gun sight for sniping in total darkness. The transport returns to base, leaving the night to Plaga, Price, the image intensifier and the Tiger. When darkness falls outside, the tension builds up. So do the mosquitoes. The intensifier is switched on. A shape approaches on the far bank. For the first time ever, we're allowed to see the secret world of the nighttime jungle. The prehistoric bulk of a great one-horned rhinoceros looms out of the darkness. Perhaps the rhino is cautious, because she knows that night is the time when the tiger prowls. Inside the Mashan, nerves get jumpy. But not because the rhino is advancing on their flimsy hide. They know the rhino would shy away rather than touch it. But because some eerie sense tells them the tiger is very close. So intent is their concentration on the rhino that they little know how close. Keep your eyes on that dark shape in the foreground. calls and stamps its foot in alarm. After it is killed, the tiger drags its victim away into the undergrowth to devour it. An amazing scene, never before filmed in the darkness of the Indian jungle. The camera team's eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball meetings with tigers were usually in daylight. Eyeballs seldom came closer than the day on which Mike Price climbed alone to the hide he had set up on a tiger trail in Chittawan National Park. Chittawan is a former royal hunting area which His Majesty the King of Nepal has declared a national park. In a short time, its tigers have learned that they are safe to move around much more freely in daylight. This suggests that tigers everywhere were far less nocturnal before man began to harass them. Price lined up his camera and waited.
It can be a lonely business waiting for a tiger in a canvas hide. Suddenly, there were stripes that moved, and they weren't the stems of grass. Even if you know about tigers, this is the moment when you have to persuade yourself very hard that only three in a thousand eat people. The tiger moved up the bank. It was so close to the hide that Price had to take his camera off the tripod and hold it by hand. He said afterwards that he was deafened by his own heartbeats. When he looked out at the other slit, the tiger was looking in. The thudding of his heart was even felt by the shaking camera. The tiger was one of the other sort, of 997 non-man-eaters living up to its improved image. That image has been enhanced by work currently being carried out in the Royal Chitawan National Park. A whole new fund of knowledge has sprung from research financed by the Smithsonian Institute of Washington and the World Wildlife Fund. In the pale light following sunrise, long lanes of white cloth are set up, very similar to those used to make the killing ring in the old style tiger hunts. This time the ring is not closed. The white cloths form a long funnel, the narrow end of which is left open. The tiger will be driven down this funnel to be shot, but not with a bullet this time, but with an anaesthetic dart. The darter is a Nepalese scientist, Kurti Tamang, who was trained at Michigan State University. His scientific colleagues working on the Smithsonian Tiger Ecology Project are both Nepalese and American. The objective, when and if a tiger is darted, is to put a radio transmitter around its neck by means of a special collar. Then the tiger will give out a signal that can be tracked wherever he goes. The capture gun is loaded with the anaesthetic dart and a low velocity charge placed behind it. Just as in a tiger hunt, the beaters are mounted on elephants. This is what's meant by tiger country. Grass, 25 feet high. The tiger is somewhere ahead and not particularly alarmed. That's a samba stag. For him, too, the beaters are still far distant. Any moment now, spooked animals will begin to run. There goes a samba. The next customer is in a state of primordial confusion. The rhino huffs and puffs, snorts and wheezes, not sure which is the correct course to take. But then rhinos are not particularly bright, and in an emergency tend to look for something or somebody to charge. Beating elephants sense that the tiger is just ahead in the thick grass. A whack on the backside to persuade the lead elephant that it's better perhaps to face the tiger than an angry mahout. The king of the jungle is in no hurry. It's not his nature to panic. Ah! 
Gördüm. Kurti Tabang has done this often before, but he doesn't stop his palms from sweating. The tiger has reached the open end of the funnel. It passes under the cameraman's tree. The dart safely home. It hit fair and square. Now the tiger will run a little way before the drug begins to work and it becomes unsteady and collapses. It must be watched closely and followed. There's the dart sticking in the shoulder. The tiger won't get much further. Five minutes is the maximum time the drug needs to take effect. But the animal could easily be lost, at least temporarily, inside those five minutes. Kurti Tamang approaches his peacefully sleeping victim, a magnificent adult female. She's collapsed on the dart, but it won't have done any harm. Only the needle will have pierced the skin. The thick body of the dart is designed so that there can be no risk of it penetrating, even with over 300 pounds of tiger lying on top of it. They turn her over. She's as stiff as a board. The Smithsonian scientists decided that the only way of learning about tiger movement and behavior in the dense vegetation of the jungle was to track them down by radio. The anesthetic dart made this possible without harmful after effects. Already a great deal has been learned about the tigers of Chitawan. That pillow of leaves, by the way, is to prevent the unconscious tiger from breathing in dust. One thing that has been discovered by radio tracking is that though the tiger is essentially a loner, it's a lot more sociable than anyone imagined. Tigers socialize far more at kills than was previously thought. It's been discovered too how brief are their encounters when mating. Afterwards, male and female go their separate ways. They're certainly not monogamous. The three resident males darted at Chitawan mated with any female in season. Adult females were either pregnant or had dependent young all the time. There's a lot of work to be done while the effects of the drug last. Kurti Tamang takes identification photographs. Tigers can often be identified by their pug marks, so those enormous pads are accurately measured and any distinguishing features noted. Canine teeth also. There's almost as much tooth inside the gum as shown in the mouth. The panting is a harmless side effect of the drug. The tigress is given water to keep her cool. It's poured on the tongue so she won't choke. It's time for the radio collar to be fitted. It's hoped that the collar will be retrieved by a later darting. Failing that, it will fall off of its own accord after two years. Each miniature transmitter has a different wavelength, so it's a simple matter when tracking to identify which animal you've located. A check to ensure that the transmitter is putting out its signal. All's well. Radio Tiger is on the air. Now the tigress will be moved into the shade to sleep off the anaesthetic in her own time. It was during her recovery that our camera team got another nasty shock.
As the tigress was beginning to come round, Mike Price ran out of film and had to climb down to fetch another magazine. Tigress was considerably more alert than he'd bargained for. Mercifully, the drug hadn't entirely worn off. But it did so very shortly afterwards, and she made off a little unsteadily into the jungle. Radio tracking is often done from light aircraft. In Nepal, there is another form of transport more readily available. A good deal of the Smithsonian project's tracking has been done from elephant back. You can't pick up signals from so great a distance as when flying low over the jungle, but an elephant does enable you to get close to your target and observe items of behavior you could never hope to spot from the air. From an elephant, the range of a transmitting tiger is anything from three kilometers to 30 yards. Here, beneath the snows of the Himalayan peaks, the sun is setting over tiger country. Darkness is the time of the tiger. But now the question is, will the total darkness of extinction fall forever on the most glorious of cats? This is something that people like ourselves can't finally decide. Only governments can do that. But people can sometimes influence governments. Somewhere out there, as night falls, a tiger is prowling, one of the last representatives of its noble race. The deer moved nervously as the hunter approaches. They will be no better off if they lose their ancient enemy. The land that supports the tiger supports them also. It is tiger country itself that's at stake. But it's not their turn yet. Anyway, not this particular night. The tiger has killed elsewhere. What you are about to see is something that may be given to few people ever to see again. Four tigers together on a kill. This extraordinary scene was filmed in the Royal Chittawan National Park. As our newfound knowledge of the species tells us, tigers can share a kill without tearing each other to pieces. They're not just sinister solitaries. But knowledge itself may not be enough. Wisdom, too, will be called for, if the tiger is not to make its final exit from the jungles of Asia. That man of religious visions and great artistry, William Blake, put it best when he wrote, Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. The question is, how long will there be forests for that tiger fire to shine in?
The brassy Indian sun rises over tiger country. The Samba stag eats in peace. The tiger is his enemy. Though for the moment no alarm calls from jungle companions break the dawn silence, but somewhere in the sun-striped shadows, the tiger is waiting. Who could ever claim that the lion is king of the beasts? The tiger is coming, and the world of the jungle knows it. burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? When the stars threw down their spears, and watered heaven with their tears. Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? William Blake, the 19th century English poet, was a deeply religious man who felt that God had surpassed himself when he created the tiger. Today we might question his views on evolution, but could anyone argue with his poetic vision? Tiger, tiger, burning bright. Tiger, the most elusive, the biggest, the most powerful produce rumors of tigers, but no definite confirmation that they exist. China once had thousands, but they're not even protected there. The tiny Balinese tiger is thought to be extinct, leaving an optimistic world total of 5,000, declining all the time. Starting with the prehistoric saber-toothed model, the tiger has always captured man's imagination. This saber tooth, which lived 30 million years ago, was only leopard sized. From saber tooth to modern art, the magic keeps its hold. Magic captured in Henri Rousseau's marvelous, if unrealistic, tropical storm with a tiger. The illustrator of this early book of beasts had quite obviously never seen a tiger. But the Romans had. This 2,000-year-old mosaic comes from Cyprus. The Mughals invaded India from Mongolia in the 14th century and ruled for 300 years. They loved to hunt tiger. Savage as this scene is, they understood conservation, one emperor even laying down plans for a tiger preserve. A descendant of the Mughals built this life-sized musical tiger devouring a European. Known as Tipu's tiger, it was the favorite after-dinner entertainment of Tipu Sultan, the ruler of Mysore in southern India. Tipu had a superstitious reverence for the tiger, only exceeded by his loathing for the invading British infidel. The British defeated and killed him at Seringapatam in 1799. It's the savagery of the tiger that fascinates. The Maharaja's victim has been given fangs of a viciousness never seen in nature. In this later painting, the tiger almost dwarfs the elephant. It's said that the main fear of every Briton arriving in India was that he would be eaten by a tiger. The artist was always ready to oblige, even if the picture did not tell the true story. Throughout the Far East, the tiger is a magic animal. In Malaya, a single whisker, ground up in a portion of tiger flesh or bone, is said to kill a man. In Indonesia, tiger milk is a cure for sore eyes and powdered bone for dog bite. This is Tiger Balm Garden. 
an extraordinary monument to a cure-all that embodies in a single ointment most of the magical properties attributed to various portions of the tiger's anatomy. There is practically nothing that this panacea won't fix. Coughs, indigestion, stomachache, seasickness, and believe it or not, even halitosis. The advertising industry appreciates the selling power of the tiger, sometimes losing a little of its dignity, but giving the tiger the one quality it's a little short on, humor. And so to perhaps the most famous power symbol of all, a tiger you put in your tank. Fifty years ago, there were 40,000 tigers in India. Today, there are fewer than one twentieth of that number. So what caused the disaster? Remembering the great tiger hunts of the Maharajas, it's tempting to answer the gun, but that would be far less than the truth. Let's go back to one of those incredible tiger hunts and see what went on and how, if at all, it affected the future status of the tiger. This unique early color film was shot for his own personal record by Lord Linlithgow, Viceroy of India in the late 30s. The hunt has been set up in his honor and that of the first lady, the vice reign. The tiger hunt, with all its ceremonial and panoply, was part of the hospitality of that vanished era. Today it may seem strange, looked at through our conservation conscious eyes, but to have refused an Eastern prince's invitation to such a hunt would have been a diplomatic insult, unthinkable of course for a viceroy. And there were still plenty of tigers left to hunt. Under the British, the rules were strict and the bags usually reasonable. Of course, there were excesses. One Maharaja accounted for 1,150 tigers in his lifetime. Among the princes, a big slaughter was often a status symbol. Everyone was mounted on elephant back, including the beaters, who moved off to encircle a large tract of country known to contain a tiger. The guns rode in howdahs, basket-like affairs that gave some protection should a tiger spring, as well as a steady platform from which to fire. The ring was built next. It consisted of the most fearsome of the great cats, the cat with a reputation for preying upon man, silent, usually hidden, deadly, and utterly beautiful, a superstar who rarely deigns to give a matinee performance by making his entrance upon the natural stage in the full light of day. By instinct, a walker in darkness, a hunter in the long shadows of the moon. The creature's home, the steaming jungles of the Far East, or so we tend to think when we hear the word tiger. But the tiger has many homes, and once had many more. In some ways, the snows suit its hot temperament better than the tropic heat, as this rare Russian archive film shows. A young Siberian tiger is captured by Russian wildlife rangers and their dogs. They're catching it for movement to an area where it can no longer prey on local farmers' stock. There are six races of tiger. They differ only in size, marking, and thickness of coat. The shaggy Siberian tiger may look ridiculously out of place in this snow scene, but prehistorically, tigers lived in the frozen north. They're quite at home in the cold. Today, one of their problems is keeping cool in the hot climates to which they later migrated. <laughs> Tigers originated in the snows of Siberia. From there, they were driven south by ice ages to the near and far east. Only 50 years ago, the six known races of tiger occupied this area. Today, their range has shrunk to this. At the top of the survival league, Indochina may hold as many as 2,000. India, the traditional stronghold, 
is down to 1,800 tigers. The thick forest of Sumatra may hide as many as 800. The lowlands of Nepal, the Terai, contain 200. The Sundarbans of Bangladesh hold around 20. There may be as many as 12 Javan tigers left. Iran and the Caspian area continue to have a large U-shaped barrier of white cloth open at the end from which the beaters and tiger will be coming. It may seem surprising that the tiger didn't leap over or burst through the cloth, but any wild animal, even a tiger, is scared of the unfamiliar. To it, the cloth is an impenetrable, encircling wall. At last, far off, the beaters are coming. The guns on their elephants wait nervously outside the ring. is just ahead in that tall grass. And there, suddenly, is the tiger, clawing at that rare elephant. It's all over. In view of the present-day plight of the tiger, we may find this scene shocking. But that is to see it out of context. Those tiger hunters of the British Raj knew the value of conservation, if only because they wanted more tigers to hunt. They preserved the most important thing of all, the kind of country in which the tiger lives. Today, former hunting preserves are the main places in which the tiger survives. The hunter's classic pose. It belongs to the faded photo album, yet the tiger owes much to it. This, rather than the gun, is the weapon the tiger must fear today. Throughout its range, the forests are coming down, and the tiger cannot live without forests. In India, it has almost complete protection from firearms. Alas, the chainsaw is far more deadly even than the bullet. This is what it kills. Tiger country. Country not only for tigers, but for every other large wild animal. And for some small ones, too. This rickety tiger cub was found dying in a field of sugarcane. The mother had given birth and then taken fright at the sound of human voices.